I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Bob Samuels, psychoanalyst and professor teaching writing at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's here to talk about his new book, Generation X and the Rise of the Entertainment Subject. As with all Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video accompanying this episode at YouTube. Just visit Trapart Films' YouTube channel, that's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube, or search for Rendering Unconscious podcast. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry from Tripart Books 2019. For more information, you can visit our publisher's website, tripart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. The newest one. Well, we're going to talk about Generation X and the rise of the entertainment subject. Right. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, I have another book that just came out a couple of weeks ago called Viral Rhetoric, and it's about the uh, metaphors of viruses in technology, culture, and in the COVID-19 period. So, um, but I think the main thing we want to talk about is the entertainment. So Generation X and the rise of the entertainment subject. And so I'm generally looking at um, uh, a period of culture kind of before the current culture where I see where I argue you can see a lot of the roots of the current culture and in particular this kind of dominance of um, technologies that deliver um, entertainment and pleasure. And so I try to really um, look at Freud's theory of the pleasure principle, which I think is often uh, misunderstood. Um, and his basic idea is that we're driven as human beings um, to um, use as little mental and, and physical energy as possible and that um, requires us to try to avoid all tension and all conflict. So it's kind of like we're driven to be conflict adverse and we're driven to um, release all uh, of our uh, built up tension. And so one form of built up tension is desire and another form of built up tension is anxiety. And so one reason why we turn to entertainment is um, not only to escape reality, but to find a release from our own um, sense of anxiety or our own tension. And so now in Generation X, you see the early roots of this because um, we didn't yet have smartphones or laptops. Um, but one of the things that started around that period were like camcorders, like people starting to walk around and turn like their lives into entertainment. So kind of like the privatization of um, public culture through um, reality media, like so the early roots of reality media. Um, and something I start off with is this um, book that I had written about, I had written about it a long time ago, which is called Generation X Goes to College. And um, this author, uh, Peter Sachs, he was a journalist and he decided to try uh, teaching in college journalism. And he was like kind of shocked by what was going on in these schools because um, from his perspective, like the students had like basically taken over the institution in the sense that 
their um, student evaluations were really important and students would you know, often resist his attempts, his attempts to teach them. And in one like very interesting moment, he describes in a class, a student bringing in a portable TV and how shocked his colleague is that you know, a student would bring a portable TV into um, a college classroom. And I argue, well, that's just like the early stage. That's the quaint, it's very quaint example. Now students have their, their phones and their laptops and they're constantly um, you know, surfing the web or accessing entertainment while they're in classes. And so you see this kind of like general rise of the entertainment subject and entertainment subjectivity during the uh, Generation X period. How do you all, how do you all do that? I can't imagine teaching and having everyone like on their phones and their laptops. It's very difficult. Like um, one time I had a student, I have a policy that you can't, I usually teach small seminars. So I had a policy, you can't be on your phone during class. And I don't, and I, I don't have students use their, um, they can't use their, computers unless they have a special reason and um I had a student when she was constantly texting and I asked her like why do you text in class it was a film class and um she said uh oh she only texts when she gets you know she feels anxious which I thought was really interesting and I said well what makes you feel anxious and she said like whenever someone says something that I disagree with and I just thought that was such an interesting example of like escaping from tension and anxiety and also the challenging of your ideas by going to the media which you can control or you can access what you want to see so this kind of sense of um, control and pleasure now Foucault talked about you know it, it, the real I think a really important thing that he wrote one of the last things that he wrote was he called the uh, control society and it was about um, you know there's this idea like it used to be that people were controlled within societies by fear and by, um, you know, violence, by uh, fear of going to hell or you know, a violent persecution or being imprisoned. So it was like a negative control. And um, in our contemporary society, people are often controlled by pleasure, right? It's kind of like the difference between, um, Neil Postman says there, you know, we move from uh, 1984 to the brave new world, right? In the brave new world, they're controlled, they're given drugs, they're given instant access to pleasure. Um, and so you don't need like the dictator from 1984. Um, people will like voluntarily give up their freedom and power and their own thinking if you provide them with pleasure. Yeah, which is what seems to be happening. <laughs> pretty, yes. Pretty widespread. <laughs> And so I try to tie this to the um, the rise of the uh, the libertarian right. So you know I try to distinguish between like the older Republican conservatives or the conservative political ideology, and then the libertarian right wing ideology, which you see with someone like um, Ronald Reagan, you know, who was an entertainer, comes from the movies, and then was a TV um, commercial person, and. Um, I analyze some of his jokes and his, um, there's a book called Reagan land where they talk about how, when he would um, do a press conference, he would like, you know, fixate on the lighting and he would have a set of jokes that he would have lined up. He would um, really kind of control the environment so that it was like a TV commercial or some type or, or TV show. Mm -hmm. And, and so you really see this kind of a thing that leads to like someone like Trump, you know, someone who, became famous mostly for um, having a television show and this kind of reality media figure. And the way that, you know, Neil Postman argues what happens in his, in his book, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, what he argues is that what happens, you know, is that everything becomes a TV commercial and that politics itself becomes a TV commercial. And so it's, so I think one of the underlying forces behind the libertarian like right wing rise in politics is um, this kind of idea that pleasure is in part defined by um, transgressing or resisting um, the need to sacrifice for the social. So like Margaret Thatcher says society, you know, there's no such thing as society. 
and that we're all just separate individuals competing and accessing, you know, our own rewards and success. And you see the same thing, you know, with Ronald Reagan's ideology. But basically, um, you know, with Trump, we get the clearest kind of example of like he represents kind of like the uh, the id, right? The inst the the subject just pursuing pleasure, and for him, the enemy is the politically correct left, which represents the superego, making these demands for us to sacrifice or or censoring us for our words, right? So the libertarian right is is obsessed by free speech, um, partially because they want to um, demonize the left wing superego as like the politically correct censor. And in some ways, this has created a weird feedback situation where the left has more and more become like the superego. You know, it used to be the left was more about um, liberation or about, you know, challenging authority structures. But now more and more so the left tends to take on um, these things that we ascribe to the superego in a sense of censoring, you know, cancel culture, censoring, political correctness, um, but also, um, you know, just uh, Zizek talks about like the superego is making these, you know, constant irrational demands, right, that we can never live up to. And so there's this sense like you can never be pure enough, you can never be good enough. And, and so I think, um, I think this is a really negative uh, movement for the left is this kind of obsession with moral political purity and, and kind of like taking on like it's like a new religion from that perspective. Yeah, and what do you think about like with with being married so married to identity? Because I feel like in psychoanalysis, we're trying so hard to like help people kind of undo all of these structures that they've like internalized and are so identified with that are really like keeping them down in some way, like the super ego or just like, you know, I'm supposed to be like this, I need to do this. And there's like so many demands. And I feel like my job is to kind of help people like break those down and be like, where did you get those ideas of all these ways you're supposed to be and all these ways you're supposed to identify so that they can be more creative and like kind of live more true to themselves. But I feel like, you know, with such a focus on people's different identities, you're really like putting people back in boxes. And I would love to like somehow get a, away from that or like, I guess, I don't know. I don't know how to do no, that. No, you're though. exactly right. But see, <laughs> see, I guess it's, you know, um, a paradox in some sense. You know, to have like um, social progress in terms of like women's rights, civil rights, gay rights, you need to focus on identity and you need to solidify around an identity group. But ultimately your goal is equality. And, and so there's a kind of paradox there is that you need um, identity in order to expand who's considered, who's protected by the law or the, by the system. Um, but then the ultimate goal is to kind of get rid of your identity and to join the universal to join. And in psychoanalysis, we have the same thing in the sense that um, you know, um, psychoanalysis, the, the foundation of thing of psychoanalysis is um, free association, the process, right? And that's about suspending your judgment, right? And we require suspending your fixed identities because you're supposed to um, speak without judgment and without censoring yourself. So it's kind of the opposite of this kind of super ego censoring. And so the idea is like the neutrality of the analyst allows for the neutrality of the analyst, the patient, because um, by the analyst not judging the patient, then the patient um, can possibly be free to say whatever comes to their mind without censoring. And so I think that um, that idea, that I think that's the foundational idea of psychoanalytic you know, treatment of the clinic in, it's been co almost completely lost by so many psychoanalysts now, and and especially therapists and what have you. They had they don't seem to use at all free association, and they've rebelled against the idea of the neutrality of the analyst, partially because of identity politics. They argue that um, to be neutral is to be privileged, and also not to deal with the um, concrete. Um, like identity issues and, and political issues and social issues and cultural issues. And so um, there's been a real kind of rebellion, especially against the younger generation, against the analytic notion of neutrality. And part of it first started kind of from like a feminist perspective, which was saying like um, only someone with like 
masculine privilege and power have the um, ability to um, be neutral because everyone else is so weighed down by their identity and, and, and defined by their identity. And so I think that was just a really like bad move within psychoanalysis. It kind of undermines the fundamental psychoanalytic process. And I found like when I go to these um, conferences and there's a lot of um, you know, young people now and it's, you know, they're interested in psychoanalysis, but their investment in identity politics and political correctness um, completely undermines like the basic foundations of psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalytic practice. Yeah, because I think, well, I'm thinking like, of course, like everybody looks a certain way and people have projections or society have projections about like what that means and who you are and that sort of thing. And so maybe the announcement comes in thinking about you a certain way based on what you look like or your offices or these kinds of judgments. Um, but also on, and I understand that, but also on the other side of it, you know, I also have a hard time identifying myself with the way that I, with, with where I'm positioned in that kind of discourse. Like I understand people might see me and think of me a certain way, but in reality, people don't know me or where I'm coming from at all. So it's kind of hard to understand, like, do we need to identify with the place where society places us? Does that, doesn't that hurt us in some way? Because maybe I don't identify with how I'm placed in society, but at the same time, it's a reality that society places me there. So I have to acknowledge that in some way. I don't know. It's really tough. Yeah. Like, so the, the book I'm just completing, like, um, my other project is, um, it's called The Psychopathology of Political Ideology. And it's kind of like playing on Freud's psychopathology of everyday life. But what I'm looking at are like the main political ideologies today. And, um, and I try to like look at what is the underlying like psychopathology of the people that are attracted to those ideologies, but also that those ideologies themselves have a certain um, psychopathology. And by that, I mean, like they use certain unconscious processes that, um, and so one very particular thing um, that is related to identity politics, and this is a very kind of controversial thing in a way, it's, it's that most like identity groups, especially social movement identity groups, um, have to take on kind of a victim identity in order to um, create solidarity, but also in order to like gain um, empathy and concern from others. And so, um, but, you know, and this is the th thing that Freud, like, you know, discovered, which is controversial, is that like, at first he thought all of his female patients were actually sexually assaulted by their fathers. And then he said, well, some of them may be, you know, fantasizing about it, right? And he came up with this theory of fantasy. And, it, and really, the question then was, well, why would someone fantasize about being sexually assaulted, right? Um, and so without like blaming the victim or denying that sexual assault happens, because actually Freud was one of the first people to talk about sexual assault. So you can't really blame him for that because he actually was one of the first people to really bring it to public you know, consciousness. Um, but he said, it is also possible for people to fantasize about being a victim. And so the question is, why does someone want to fantasize about being a victim? And one of the things like um, I've written a lot about, especially you know, from the right, I think I've, I, talked about this a couple of times, but um, you know, I, I know a lot of very wealthy people in where I live. There's a lot of wealthy people and a lot of them are Republicans. And, um, and I have this particular guy I know who's extremely wealthy. And all he talks about is how he's a victim of taxes, of government regulations, of, um, of speech codes, right? And he actually lives his life as a victim. So it's very interesting, you know, and you listen to Trump, Trump would always talk about, you know, he's a victim of the media. He's a victim of, you know, politicians in his own party. He's, you know, um, he presented himself as a victim. So you have this like super wealthy person who's like the president of like the most powerful country in the world, constantly representing himself as a victim. And so the question is like, what drives that um, desire to perceive yourself as a victim, right? And I think it's a huge aspect in psychoanalysis. A lot of people come into analysis and they tell a story and at the center of the story is a scene of victimization. And whether that victimization actually happened or didn't happen, 
the question I think for psychoanalysis is how does that affect your identity and the way you see the world, right? And 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 is it a fixated identity? Is it identity, you know, and and so the power of being a victim is that like the victim can't be criticized, the victim is innocent, and the other is by definition evil. And I see this all the time in politics. Um, recently I had a uh, you know, I was the president of our faculty union for 13 years. And then um, I lost an election and this new group came in. And what's really interesting is that they're, um, they like refuse to negotiate with the university, even though like they're in a contract negotiation for the last like two and a half years. And the way that they talk to the university is like, you're evil, we're good. Um, and they believe that because they're being victimized or mistreated, that anything they do is justified. And so it doesn't matter if they, you know, make things up or lie or if they say horrible things or if they, you know, shame the other side or make the other side feel guilty. They feel it's justified because they're, they've identified themselves as the victim and they've identified the others as evil. So you've got this kind of polarized relationship, which we see so much now in politics, right? You're either like the victim or you're the perpetrator. And it creates like no space for um, dialogue or negotiation. And it feeds all these underlying um, unconscious identifications and processes that ultimately, you know, is something that this idea of like Lacan of traversing the fantasy. Well, I think the fundamental fantasy is this fantasy of victimhood. And, and the question is like, you know, um, it's very controversial because we're told that we should immediately believe the victim and that it's wrong to even think, question the victim or get the victim to question themselves. But from a psychoanalytic perspective, I think um, we don't, the idea of neutrality is like basically we don't accept or reject anything, right? We create a space where people are supposed to explore the truth and uh, we don't know what the truth is. Um, and so we're not like, you know, making a judgment. We're not making a judgment whether, you know, society should be more, at least as analysts, whether, you know, Freud, Lacan talks about this in a way, you know, saying that we're not choosing the side of the liber, libertine, of the like freeing of sexuality, and we're not picking the side of like social control or the social um, regulation of sexuality, right? We are allowing for that conflict to be presented and then people having to make choices based on that. But identity politics kind of blocks any possibility for change or transformation or critical analysis because it's based on this, these kind of fixed um, identities that um, don't allow for any questioning. Yeah, and in my view, that kind of thinking of like either this or this or putting people in boxes is very much the kind of old patriarchal thinking that people seem to be trying to get away from. So like if you don't want people to kind of box you into these categories, then why box yourself into these categories? And also your identity can change over time or your sexuality or to be, you can be kind of a different person or in a different position based on who you're interacting with or, you know, think, things change. <laughs> uh, right, so it kind you, of reminds yeah. me of like when people used to argue about like, about being gay and like, oh, but you're, you're born this way so you can't help it. But it's like, but what if you just want to fool around with someone of the same gender, you know? <laughs> for fun or maybe you just want to do it now but you don't want to do it in another relationship like how is it okay if you're born that way but not okay if you just want to do it that way or just feel driven to do it that way like that all the ways should be okay <laughs> right so i mean I, I think you put up a really good point though this idea that like identity is something that psychoanalysis really calls into question you know and you know freud's theory you know that fundamentally our sexuality is polymorphously perverse right and that it, the kind of like gender identity or gender identification is something that is constructed over time and is not like, you know, necessarily, it's not natural and it's not inevitable. And that, you know, um, we're born perverse, right? And polymorphous. So let's like psychoanalysis is really, you know, counter to um, 
current kind of idea of like identity politics and something which is also really controversial and I, I don't know how to talk about it really is this like idea that um uh so one of the things I teach is writing like I teach advanced writing so students write about film and I like help them become better writers or you know I I read and critique their writing and the growing thing in, in, in the field of writing is at uh, college writing is that um to um like correct students writing especially to correct their grammar their word choice their um uh like anything their you know their structure or even really their their um their ideas is a form of white supremacy because um it's by definition discriminatory and racist but they actually call it white supremacy you know because it's like um there's this certain form of accepted white discourse that we force people to conform to and we penalize them when they don't and so but they go as far as saying even like teaching students science objectivity reason since these things came from the western enlightenment by mostly white males that they're tied to the identity of white males and so therefore like reason objectivity and science are themselves forms of white supremacy and the first problem I have is like, okay, there's a difference between like being a Nazi, right? And correcting someone's grammar, right? I think, I think, it, it, but this is an aspect of like the hysterical left in the sense that I say hysteria in the sense of this um, use of the unconscious processes of um, uh, like hyperbole and of um, emotion, uh, emotional manipulation and in no way do I think this is like a, a female thing but I think that um, the psychoanalytic understanding of hysteria um, deals with like the use of these kind of unconscious processes that kind of manipulate um, reality and also are used to manipulate other people and so um, I think that um, it's just so destructive to say that you know to teach students to you know write in a more effective manner is white supremacy. I just think that is just like, or to teach them to try to be logical or to try to analyze things from an objective perspective. Because their idea is if you're a person of color, you're so tied to your identity that um, you can't see things objectively. Everything is based on your personal experience. Um, and so to ask someone to be objective or neutral um, is to ask them to deny their identity and who they are. Like whitewashing. Is the argument with English like because of the, Brit the British being colonizers that the British language is, I don't know. No, it's more so like just, um, you know, a standard American English. The, the, the idea is, it really came out of um, actually a lot of like, um, mostly in California, um, actually Asian Americans, people from like um, Cambodia and Laos and, um, and Vietnam, and then people from um, Mexico who came to America and who were um, not being able to succeed in college because they kept on failing like language tests. And so the argument was, and this part I, I, I kind of, you know, see, you know, was that, well, the tests, because of the tests are, are basically um, rewarding and punishing your conformity to standard American English, um, then that is a form of like colonialism or white supremacy. Um, and so the solution is to like get rid of the tests and to get rid of the correcting and to um, the new move now is to affirm like multilinguality, multilinguistics meaning that we shouldn't um, impose like a single standard of language and that we should um, allow our students to um, use their home languages as their main language or or equally value that but it's very hard like to teach a course like in college writing and have everyone you know equally value their home language and first of all I don't think that'll help them in their other classes and it won't help them necessarily when they, if they apply for jobs, you know, in, in places or anything. And, um, but it is a big issue. It's like, it is a form of like identity politics, which is like, I think made it 
very difficult to teach and also um, it has completely politicized like every aspect of education. Right. So maybe in thinking of the class, it just has to be thought of as like this is learning, helping you learn how to write in this way that's accepted for job applications and to write better gram grammatically for school and that sort of thing. And that's why they would be taking the class. Otherwise, why would you be taking a writing class? Because you're required to, that's the problem. You know, they're, they're required to do certain fulfillments and so they, they don't want to. And so another big issue, and I wrote about this in, somewhere else is that I'm, like all of a sudden one year I had like majority of my students were from mainland China, right? And a lot of them had, um, and they were there basically because the university wants money, right? Because they don't get financial aid and they pay the full tuition. And and so um, all of a sudden we got like, you know, huge number of students from mainland China. And a lot of them, well, they're, 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 they're English writing and like speaking and hearing skills were very like all, all across the board, right? Like, you know, but a lot of them had a very difficult time, right? And they were really good in some of their other classes, but they were like to getting, they weren't, they're in America getting a U US um, doctorate. I mean, not doctorate, an undergraduate degree. Um, but until they got to my class, they had kind of successfully, you know, not had to really um, write in English or speak in English very much. Like in their other classes, they mostly had multiple choice tests they would get like textbook that were in Mandarin and they would just, you know, hang out among themselves. And so they weren't really picking up the language skills. And so then they would get to my class and it would be like, okay, I don't, I'm not really sure what to do because I still have to I judge you according to certain criteria. If I can't understand what you're writing and if you can't understand what I'm saying, it's like very hard to figure out, you know, how I'm supposed to like teach you and then evaluate you. And um, it was, it's a huge problem. And, and most of my colleagues have just decided that um, it's not our place to judge other people basically. <laughs> and that actually one of the main things we have to do as teachers is raise the self-esteem of students. So it's kind of like the self-esteem movement from parenting has moved to like education and this idea then, so we shouldn't judge them or evaluate them. And we shouldn't like necessarily, you know, it would be racist to judge them by our standards. And so um, we have to just like not judge them. Like, so everyone gets A's and you don't judge them. And, um, and I think it's a real issue with like global education, globalized education, you know, I mean, you're in Sweden, right? Mm -hmm. There is like, um, there is like this tension, but um, when I was in Sweden, you know, it was interesting, you know, just how well so many people spoke English and how basically I think there is this global kind of issue is um, in order to, you know, be in a global like arena in communication in culture and business, you know, how necessary is it to like um, learn like English? And is that like a global, you know, colonialism or is it, us moving more and more to a global culture where people have their own home languages, but then there is a default lingua franca, which is English. Yeah, I, I think, think of it as like I think of it as like going along with technology, like the technology um, computers have like kind of a common language, and and English, like like I know people here whose kids are going to school for things like science and engineering and technology. And like one of the mothers is really upset that the child is learning it in Swedish because she's like, they're not going to be able to apply that anywhere. They need to be learning like the science and technology and the IT and engineering skills in English because that's the only way they're going to be getting a job. So yeah, it's probably true. So she wants them to be learning in English because yeah, that's the better way to get a job just like it seems like I'm trying to think of it like a tool. And when I'm learning Swedish now, I keep joking that I'm decolonizing myself because I'm trying to get the English out and learn Swedish and then use the English as a tool for like work. <laughs> like I use the computer. <laughs> right. 
No, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh. But I saw that like last time I was, you know, throughout Europe and stuff. Um, I saw like all these, for better or worse, I saw all these groups defaulting to English, you know, and, um, but still maintaining their, I mean, the threat is like in France, the threat is, like I used to be a musician in France and um, I was in a group and it was really like, and half the band's groups, the songs were in English, half were in French. And then I found out that like on, there's a, there was a law in France that um, half, at least on the radio, half the songs had to be in French because they were trying to like maintain their French culture against the assault of, you know, foreign cultures, but especially British and English mm. culture. And I understand that, you know, in some way, you know, I can understand, but you can, you can like try to integrate both, right? Yeah, or you can try to like um, value both in a way. And um, like rock, like rock music in French is just not very good usually. <laughs> it's like something, so like, why would you like purposely like, you know, you know, put yourself in a, in a position where you try to like, like certain languages, just like the, the sounds of the languages, um, go along with certain types of music better than others. I really think that's true. And maybe that's a form of white supremacy, but it's not like just white music or whatever, or English music or American music. But I think generally there is this relationship between like certain forms of music, you know, and different languages and cultures. Mm -hmm. yeah, Does that sound racist? No, I think this is true. <laughs> different music developed from different cultures, probably because those sounds work well with that kind of tone. Like the language and the sounds go together with the with the way the music ended up developing. Yeah, so I guess there's this there's this tension between trying to help make sure people are able to preserve their culture and that everything doesn't get whitewashed. Because that's another right. thing. Like moving here, you know, everybody does speak English and they speak English really well, and it's all for media. And, you know, it's everybody consumes American media, American movies, American music. Um, and that's happened pretty globally. And with the technology and with computers, uh, all of these things are built between California and China, basically, right? <laughs> so, like, you know, all of the computers are kind of coming through the same uh, lens as well. And it's taken over globally. So it's kind of happened in that way already. So maybe the idea is like trying to use that, like trying to use the technology for what it could be useful for. And then trying to use the fact that a lot of people do speak English globally as like a way to be able to like, look, now all these different cultures can communicate, you know, like maybe in a way that can be useful in some way because it's already happened. But then also trying to help people preserve their cultures uh, locally at the same time, you know? Right, and actually, you know, there is that paradox because on one hand, like Netflix, so I don't know, like I've been getting a lot of recommendations from Netflix for like Nordic, you know, uh, mysteries or- Yeah, there's or so many of stuff. them. Yeah, like them that. And, <laughs> and, or like even that, you know, uh, Lupin, the French, you know, detective thing was in, in French, right? It wasn't in, um, and so I think on one hand, yes, there is this kind of dominance of like, you know, English language media, but there also is this reverse thing where stuff that like I would never have access to, you know, like like that, that the Korean film that won the uh, Academy Award, yeah, Parasite, right. yeah, it was like, um, that's like the flip side, right? That's the other side. It was very Korean, right? And it was, you know, and, um, but uh, it got a global audience through these global platforms. So there is this, there's this threat of like culture being globalized, homogenized, but at the other hand, you know, it's like the paradox of the food court. I think Frederick Jameson wrote about this or, no, I don't think he did, but okay. I'm just <laughs> pretending he did. You know, the, you go to like a food court, right? You get like, uh, you go from the, now like every mall in America has like a food court and you have Japanese food, Mexican food, um, like usually Greek place, an Italian place, right? And so on one hand, like, so what form of globalization is that? On one hand, you're getting like the watered down American version of these um, specific different cultures. 
Um, and so on one hand, it's kind of like, so is that like homogenization? But the other hand, the American palette or whatever experience is also being, you know, um, reshaped by these different food traditions. So it's a dialectic and it's not a pure imposition of, you know, a hom homogenous colonial uh, culture, but it's, it's a dialectical interaction between these kind of diverse traditions and the, this more like global universal. Yeah, and that's what my mom was telling me because she started watching the Swedish detective films too because I was talking about them. That's how I've been learning Swedish is watching all these movies in Swedish. And then um, she started telling me about like an Italian detective show she's watching and, and this French one as well. So they are going that way too, which is good, you know. So maybe maybe that will just continue to happen more and more. Get right. more and influx from other places. Another thing that I teach and that I've written about, you know, in places and I'm trying, I have a book that I someday want to write, but I can't get myself to write it, you know, is about um, global progress. So there are all these people now, um, like Steven Pinker, um, Enlightenment now, arguing, you know, that, and I think this is kind of true, right? Like people have never lived longer. They've never, even with the pandemic, you know, it's, it's hard to see this, you know, people have never had more freedoms. People have never um, had, you know, more access to leisure, people have never, you know, all these things that I think we would say, um, you know, are globally a good thing on average, right? Like the lifespan for humans, global lifespan for humans has doubled in the last 150 years, okay? The um, global dire poverty rate or poverty rate has decreased 90% um, in the last 30 years, okay? Mostly China, India, but, you know, other places. So I think it would be hard to say like, these are not good things. So the question is like, what is driving this global progress, right? Um, and, you know, Pinker and argues, you know, it's three institutions, it's uh, science, um, democracy, and he calls humanism, okay. It's kind of hard to figure out what he means by that, but basically enlightenment philosophy. And, and so, um, when people say, oh, you know, you're, you're teaching, you know, reason uh, or science or academic discourse, it's oppressive. But the idea behind the enlightenment was that it was a, you know, uh, like Descartes says, the first stage of the scientific method is to suspend all biases, all prejudices, right? And this is the same idea as psychoanalysis, I argue, right? The analyst is supposed to suspend all judgment and the patient is supposed to suspend all judgment and say whatever comes into their mind. And so, um, why, so people fear like the Western enlightenment is a form of colonialism based on white property males, you know, um, identity or values. But the idea is, is this, it is um, this, what is allowed for the global progress. Um, in order to have democracy, you have to kind of suspend individual interests, right? And you have to have universal laws. Um, in order to have science, you have to suspend self-interest and you have to discover the truth um, in an objective and rational manner. Um, and so basically what has driven and helped most people in the world are, is this kind of global um, universality, neutrality, you know, reality principle, you might say, I would say from a Freudian perspective. But um, so I think that this is a real like tension, especially in the academic left, um, where people don't want to say like, there's a better way of doing things because they wanna say like, because we have to respect everyone's culture and everyone's history, we can't make any like moral judgments. This is kind of moral relativism. We, we have to, um, we can't say like, there's a better way of doing things. And so we kind of are blind to what has actually helped people from all over the world, like this, these institutions of science and democracy. And so the question is like, how do we promote and protect those institutions? And um, I think like something like identity politics gets in the way because it's not based on universality. It's not based on um, globalization. Um, and especially in politics, like very few like political parties have a global perspective, right? It's, it's still nationalistic, even though so much of our world is global, like global media, global trade, you know, so much um, global movement of people, uh, the, the World Wide Web. 
So we have kind of a, a globalized culture, um, but we don't have a globalized politics, right? And I think that is like a fundamental problem that we see with the pandemic is that you know, people realize in some ways, like something that happened in China, if that's where it started, can spread all over the world. So we're not disconnected and we can't just have national policies. We have to have global policies. We need the World Health Organization because we need to deal with like pandemics, right? And, um, and also with climate change, we need a global response. It doesn't matter if like we, you in Sweden there, you know, reduce, matters very little. Like if you guys, you know, reduce your um, carbon, although you're, are you heavily dependent on uh, oil? Like, or is yeah. that only Norway? No, Norway is the big one. They're, yeah. They found the oil. But yeah, it's like, yeah, we try to eat mostly vegan and we're going to have beef, but it's not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you need a global solution that looks at the totality of it. And so, so the whole idea of the nation state, and also you have multinational corporations, which are more powerful in some ways than individual nation states. And, and, and they can always just move their taxes to another area, low, move their you know, profits to a low tax area. They can always avoid regulations by setting up shop in a low regulated place. So you need like global systems of law and global regulations. And, and that requires like a global like political cooperation. And so we're so fixated on the nation state and on national politics and local politics that we, um, like when I had my students like look on the web about global politics, all they found were like conspiracy theories about um, some secret conspiracy or something. <laughs> yeah, or George Soros and that. No, but it's really true. And especially, you know, if you travel and, you know, there's so much pollution and like in certain places I've been to, there's just like plastic everywhere. Like there's like strewn like everywhere. And it's like, it would really take like a global effort of everyone like walking on the earth and like cleaning up all this garbage because it's really, I mean, it's really insane how much pollution and garbage there is everywhere. And like Zizek says, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, I kind of like this part when his ideas is like, the reason why like we have recycling is to make us think that we're part of the solution and that recycling is not gonna fix the problem. And actually, you know, I had a student do research on this. It was very interesting. Like 75% of the cause of um, carbon emission and climate change is due to um, uh, China, India, and the United States mm -hmm. countries, you know. And, um, and also in, in some ways, like the protection of the rainforest, which just plays a key role. And so um, if you don't attack those problems, like um, coal burning plants in China, our agricultural system in the United States, which is the biggest contributor to um, climate change. Um, India, the, the horrible um, infrastructure that they have and um, energy system that they have. If you don't deal with those, you're not gonna fix the problem, right? And so it doesn't matter if you as an individual put the right can in the right trash thing, it kind of absolves your guilt and makes you think you're part of the solution and so that's kind of like sad. It's kind of like, or it's kind of like- It's also like, it's like sharing a tweet. It's like, oh, I shared the tweet about the good thing that I want right, right, to be right, activist right, about. Right. But like, what right. does that really do? Not much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps yeah. you from going outside and actually protesting. <laughs> You're just like, I'll just share these tweets instead, you know? <laughs> no, totally, totally. Um, so it absolves your guilt, right? but it doesn't fix the problem. It's like virtue signaling, you know? And so I think that that's a tremendous, you know, issue that we have. It's an existential issue is, and this kind of ties back to the book on Generation X, the rise of the entertainment subject, you know, cause um, one of my arguments is like the, the biggest threat to the world um, is not like climate change or pandemics or nuclear weapons, terrorism, or whatever you have it. It's actually, you know, um, virtual reality or media pleasure because we won't care about any of these problems if we can retreat into an artificial world that gives us instant access to pleasure. 
we won't care if the rest of the world is being destroyed. I think that's one of the ideas of the matrix in a way, like they're saying like, okay, the world is all these apocalyptic movies, the world has been destroyed, like in the matrix, but no one knows it because everyone is sharing the same virtual reality and they're living in all, you know, whatever. So if we have instant access to whatever we want on an imaginary level, why should we care if our environment is being destroyed or if people are being, you know, dying from a pandemic um, or if there is a nuclear, you know, war, whatever, like we can still live in our artificial reality. And I think that that's why it's so important to try, try to use psychoanalysis to take a critical perspective on media pleasure because um, we often think like pleasure is like inherently a good thing, but from psychoanalysis, it's a very ambivalent thing. You know, it's got, it's very ambivalent in a way that it can be like the death drive, right? You know, Freud said very early on in 1895 in the Project for Scientific Psychology, he tied the pleasure principle to what he called the inertia principle. And he said that, you know, this idea that we're driven to use as less mental and physical energy as possible means that like basically our goal is to return to a state of inanimation, right? To death, like mm -hmm. our goal is death in a way. And so it shouldn't be surprising if we allow the world to, to be destroyed, um, if like we're driven fundamentally to like escape from reality and to use as little mental and physical energy as possible. Yeah, exactly. And especially with the temp pandemic, I could, I kept telling Carl, I could see how this is happening and how like, like in Blade Runner 2049, where people are like living in these like high rises, little boxes, but they just have their screen, you know, it's like, I was literally, it, you know, in the apartment, like watching the, the fire log on YouTube, you know, and actually like sitting by it on the couch because it actually helped me feel like warmer you know, over the winter or like watching like the blue planet. And it's like, we're destroying the actual planet, but then we're all like watching the animals. Or Carl always says like, you know, we, we talk about the cloud all the time and how like, you know, the, the cloud is not a cloud. It's a bunch of computers. And like, where are these computers? They're on like islands in Indonesia and stuff. They're like, they're like islands of computers so that we can have our cloud in the West or whatever and just like upload all this ridiculous stuff that we're just vomiting out constantly on Twitter and, and Facebook and everything. And like Carl says, how many pictures of those are like pictures of cute animals that are like sitting on these hard drives on an island somewhere, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, while we're killing the actual animals, we're like looking at pictures of them and like how nice, oh, look how nice the earth used to be. Like, oh, so good that we had these like really high definition cameras that we could film the earth and the rainforest before we destroy it. And we can all watch it on our screen while we're like sitting and like being fed by tubes, like in these little boxes one day, you know? Yeah, that's why all these like billionaires, like you know, um, Jeff Bezos and Branson, you know, all these billionaires are they're 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 creating their own like you know rockets. It's kind of like, well, you know, like let's find an alternative to the Earth, like to the world. Let's 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 at least the wealthy people can go to another place. You know, like a lot of wealthy libertarians, like they're buying islands, you know, and and preparing for the ap apocalypse, so that they have their you know place instead of dealing with the problems directly you know they're creating fantasy islands in order to escape from you know the destroyed earth what, what do they think they're gonna do on mars <laughs> like do they think it's gonna be fun to like walk around in suits and not have oxygen you know naturally you know like <laughs> Well, know. they're denying life. So if, it's, if the death drive <laughs> is about denying life to live in an artificial world, then, you know, yeah, they'll live in their little space. We're really doing suits. that. Yeah. Well, it's really so. happening, guys. <laughs> and what kills me is like, I just, so I just think like psychoanalysis becomes more and more relevant. And yet it, it's fewer and fewer people like understand it or care about it. So it's kind of, it's such a paradox. You know, I think Freud said, you know, if a society, any society um, that, you know, would need psychoanalysis, you know, wouldn't like care about it. And any society that doesn't need psychoanalysis would care about it. like some paradox like that. It's like, it's, it's really, you know, um, yeah, difficult. And I think part of the problem is people just fundamentally don't understand the basic ideas of psychoanalysis, I guess, because they're counterintuitive. Like this idea that pleasure is about escape, you know, that's see, that's kind of, or that pleasure could be a negative thing. Pleasure can be the pleasure principle could be equivalent to the death drive. That just seems yeah. You like can pleasure so yourself to death. Right. 
Yeah, we know like animals, you know, <laughs> you give them a little thing lever they can touch and get cocaine, they're gonna kill themselves, right? They're gonna keep on doing it, you know, until they destroy themselves. And so this is what we see in addiction too. Like addiction, you know, the paradox of addiction is that it seems like it's instant access to pleasure, but it actually, you know, causes intense, you know, depression and anxiety, right? You, with the high comes the low and that, um, and that, you know, ultimately it's self-destructive. And so um, that's another thing that really fascinates me at the same time, like Trump was gaining power, like Trump in the death drive, you know, like the sense, the same time that, you know, Trump was gaining power, we had this opiate epidemic in the United States in the same places that were like voting heavily for him. And, and then we have like the pandemic, we have the people who refuse to get vaccinated in the same regions. So there's this like correlation of this death drive, right? Of like the people who want to escape from society and just pursue their own self-interest are also the people who are most prone to self-destructive opiate addictions and also to refusing like the signs that will allow them to live. And so there is this kind of like death cult, you know, people are willing to die in order to hold on to their um, access to like individual freedom and, and pleasure, right? And so, I mean, there's a guy in that capital uh, six uh, American insurrection, whatever you want to call it, he had a flag that said, don't tread on me, right? Which is like the, the Southern thing, like, you know, don't tell me what to do, you know, don't, don't, don't try to regulate me. And he got trampled on, you know, it was so ironic, you know, he got his, his people like actually walked over him and he almost died by being trampled on, holding a flag that says, don't tread on me, you know? And, but that's such a paradox of the right, you know, it's like, they think they're pursuing, you know, their freedom and enjoyment, but in fact, they're like, they're killing themselves and they're killing the people around them. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of those Trump rallies during the coronavirus that he had ended up being like super spreader events where a lot of people got the virus. And uh, yeah, and that's the other thing with this whole rhetoric of like, don't regulate me. It's like the right's not regulating corporations. <laughs> and the corporations are taking are killing you also <laughs> with all these chemicals and and everything else that they're doing destroying the earth like you said moving to different places where they won't get taxed but like the people like take on this rhetoric like as if it's about them personally but like <laughs> you don't have any more freedom you're not the person being regulated so we need to regulate things like corporations to protect you from them but they, but they don't seem to understand that yeah i think because there's this underlying fantasy of like you know total freedom and enjoyment and it's interesting like the u.s you know constitution this like the life liberty and the pursuit of happiness like it's like you know written into our you know political like uh values or traditions you know is and once again that life liberty and pursuit of happiness can, it's like the pleasure principle it's like saying like which is the flip side is the death drive it's like saying like yes we want to be free in order to kill ourselves and everyone else the way we us. want yeah yes yes <laughs> we want the freedom to self-destroy ourselves self-destruct ourselves in whatever and that's what we want yeah right so. and what's the point of having a government at all because what does the government do well, ideally, they don't want a government, right? So, I mean, Reagan said the government is not the solution, it's the problem, right? So there's a long history of the right basically, you know, saying, and Margaret Thatcher saying there's no society, you know, she's saying, like, basically, there should be no government. Like, ultimately, from a free market perspective, there should be no government, right? I mean, it's a complete fantasy, and it's an impossibility, but that's the kind of the underlying you know, it's the it's the myth Freud's myth of the primal father right the one who comes before the regulation before the sons get together and kill off the primal father that's the fantasy of the right is like yes this you know Trump represented this kind of primal father enjoyment there he is you know he can grab any woman wherever he wants right he can say whatever he wants he can do whatever he wants people like identify they want to live vicariously through the primal father who represents this fantasy of total freedom and total enjoyment. So once again, it's like fantasy that fundamentally regulates our politics and people's perception of politics is 
is completely on an unconscious fantasy basis. Yeah, and then the total opposite side of the very, very, very far left, also this like utopian thing where everyone's the same, but how does that work if there's no government or something regulating that? You know, there's always ends up being like somebody on top. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think, but I think you know, I was just saying before. I think the 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 fundamental fantasy of the left now is the fantasy of victimization, right? And and so um, so you have on one hand you have this kind of uh, fantasy on the right of the primal father, the per, you know pure the person who has total freedom to enjoy, and on the left you have the the fantasy of um, being a total victim and um, and having your identity defined by your victim status. And so in those ways, those two fantasies are really powerful, but they're like opposed to each other, right? One is about, um, you could say on a fundamental of displeasure and the other one is about pleasure. Right, and, and like you said, Trump was always acting like the victim and a lot of the like white, you know, guys that voted for right, Trump, right, they're right. all like, you know, feel like they've been victimized too and not gotten their fair share and all this. Yeah, so the great trick, yeah, the great trick of the right, you know, and we see this starting with Nixon, you know, almost like in this way, almost like a conscious strategy was um, reverse racism and reverse victimization. So they took the tactics of the left and the ideology of the left and they just reversed the, um, the players in a way. They said, oh, the true victims of society are the wealthy or the white or the Christians. Like, you know, Trump like, oh, you know, you can't say uh, Merry Christmas anymore. You know, right. you can't, you know, I'm a, you know, you, you're a victim because, oh, I can't use the term terrorist or I can't like whatever, you know. So the victims are the white male Christians, right? And so while for the left, you know, the victimizers were the white male Christians, um, you know, like Reagan's idea of the welfare queens, perfect example. Oh, it's the poor people are actually the victimizers and the rich people are being victimized by the poor people who, um, because they are demanding welfare, we have to pay high taxes. And so the welfare queen is this woman driving around um, in a Cadillac, uses this example, you know, mm -hmm. um, who got the money from the government dole um, which was taken directly from the wealthy, the hard earning wealthy people. So the wealthy people in this reverse fantasy structure, the wealthy people are the victims and the um, poor people are the victimizers. And that is like a constant idea of like immigrants, you know, immigrants are the victimizers. They're um, taking over our schools they're making us pay taxes. They're, you know, they're- they're Taking our they're, jobs. And, 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 and causing crimes, you know, and so we're the victims of the victimized. And, and so the right was able to basically take the, um, a lot of the ideology and psychology and, and tactics of the left and appropriate them, but also reverse their content. And once again, I think this is all like psychological, right? It's mm -hmm. all psychological. It's, it's you know. It really um, is. And another thing, I know you had to go soon, but another thing that I just wanted to point out too, because you talked about the enlightenment and what the enlightenment was trying to get away from was like the church and the church had like a total stranglehold over all discourse and what, what anybody could say or do about anything. And those are the real like original colonizers. If you want to talk about that, it's like the church bringing monotheism and Christianity just like blanketly making everybody kind of do that. And if you didn't, you'd be persecuted and killed. And the Enlightenment thinkers were like the car was trying to say, I'm allowed to have my own thoughts and opinions and to disagree with these kinds of things. And that's kind of where it started. Yeah, but but Descartes, when he writes Discourse on a Method, he's writing it to defend Galileo, who was, you know, put in jail from the church. But he's so paranoid that he decided not to publish it. And he also like, you know, tries to prove the existence of so he's he's constantly saying, okay, okay, you know. I'm not being anti, you know, Christian or anti, you know, like God exists. Okay, that's okay. I'm going to even prove God exists. But he's saying like, okay, we have to, you know, the strategy is like divide, like say, okay, you guys have that stuff, that belief stuff. And then, but here's science over here. And so the way that science develops is through the separation of the church and state or church and science. And, um, but it was definitely, as you're saying, it is definitely a reaction to the, 
dominance, social dominance of, of the church and the church using state oppression in order to um, control people. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Bob Samuels. For more, you can check out his YouTube channel, Robert Samuels. Links to everything can be found at the text accompanying this episode. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Rendering Unconscious is also a book, Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, from Tripart Books 2019. For more information, you can visit our publisher's website, tripart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. And now, The Result by White Stains from their album, Single-Minded Dualisms, Singles from 1987 to 1989. You can find the album on the Highbrow Low Life Bandcamp page, highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com, and it's also streaming at streaming services such as Spotify and iTunes. Enjoy. Indulge in the 
care for one and all The result is yet to come Just don't lust for it If we move by ourselves 